everyone, I'm Stuart Deming with Explore.Nash. Make sure to go follow us on Instagram, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also hit that bell if you haven't turned on notifications for our videos. I'm standing in front of the historic RCA Studio B. This is considered to be the home of a thousand hits. And I had the wonderful opportunity to sit down with Justin Croft, the manager of RCA Studio B, to learn more. Hey. <laughs> uh, so Justin, uh, introduce yourself, uh, tell us how long you've been working here, what you love about this building, what you love about the history, and then tell us about uh, the process of what the vision of RCA is today. Sure. Um, yeah, uh, I'm Justin Croft. I'm the studio manager here at RCAB. I have been here in that capacity for about five years. Um, started here in March 2014. Um, before that, I was a student here um, in Belmont's audio engineering technology program. So I used to work here at night. I would help with academic sessions, that kind of thing, and be here till you know, two in the morning or whatever. I came here in large part because, well, actually I picked Belmont to study in large part because I knew that access to Studio B was part of that new part of the classes took place here and that once you got to a certain level, you could record here. Uh, today, Studio B is one of the only studio tours you can take in Nashville. Probably, well, one of the few in the country, actually. Uh, of course, there's Sun in Memphis and Stax. There's Motown that you can visit. Um, and all of those are in the same league, as far as I'm concerned. They're all hugely important recording studios, including this one, of course. Um, there's a great book called Temples of Sound out there, and we're one of the temples of sound, um, <clears throat> among all those other amazing classic American studios. So, you know, we see upwards of 100,000 people or so a year wow. through Studio B. Uh, our mission, of course, is educational. We're a nonprofit here, uh, operated by the Country Music Hall of Fame Museum, uh, in partnership with the Mike Kerb Family Foundation, who owns the building, actually. It leases it to us charitably for just a dollar a year every year. That's how we're able to do what we do. And so we have visitors of every stripe from all over the country, literally all over the world. Uh, a lot of folks from Europe, England, uh, all the way from Australia, New Zealand, uh, come here from all over uh, to visit, to have a tour, which is always historical and educational. Our mission is educational. So uh, really, if you want to break that down, that's to educate people about this studio, about historic recording processes, about you know, how Nashville sort of came to be in many ways. Um, you know, mostly, mostly focused on the studio itself and its history and some of the artists and some of their history. Um, but there is an overall thing of how are records made? How were they made then versus how they're made now? Something I talk about quite a lot. So <clears throat> we have visitors from all over. We have uh, student groups, of course, who can come here and as part of their experience record music. They can bring their their school orchestra or jazz band or choir or yeah, concert cool. band, even a marching band. I've had steel drum bands and classical guitar groups, every, anything you can think of. They come here and, and we always give context to the space. So there's always a bit of a tour so that they know the background of where they are. And then we will record with them as well. Um, we do other sorts of educational programs as well with schools and with families to give sort of a history and also a recording sort of 101 um, of how to go about making records, again, with that approach of then and now. You know, so we show people about uh, magnetic tape recording, for example, which is in vogue again these days, but it's not standard practice either anymore. You know, obviously we're into the world of, of digital recording. Let's go into the history of this building. Yeah. Why was it built? <clears throat> uh, who are some of the biggest uh, musicians that played here or recorded here? And then... I think another really cool question is what is the most profitable song mm. ever recorded at RCA Studio yeah. B? Yeah, interesting. So <clears throat> the studio in many ways came about in large part to RCA acquiring Elvis's contract. From so, Sun Records, From correct? Sun Records, from okay. Sam Phillips, right. Um, and that happened a few years before the studio was built. RCA, of course, had studios in New York. They had studios in California. Um, and they built this place very much with Elvis in mind. Um, like I say, having just ac acquired his contract a few years earlier, a guy named Steve Scholes, who was a vice president of RCA, was heavily involved in, in securing Elvis's contract. And he worked a lot in Nashville just prior <clears throat> to the studio. 
RCA was using a space um, called Trafco, it was the Television, Radio, and Film Commission of the Methodist Church, which existed only a few blocks from here. It's now just a parking lot. It's, it's, it's nowhere to be seen. Um, they were sharing that space with the Methodist Church. So it was this interesting, <laughs> dyna- at least in my imagination, this interesting dynamic going on between. Well, I, I heard one time yeah. Elvis had to record in a store, like a stairway. Yeah, to to achieve a particular effect there, uh, like an echoey, reverby effect. Um, they either put him in a stairway, or um, it could have been that they placed a you know a speaker in the stairway, mm-hmm. piped his voice to that speaker, and recorded that sound. Something that we recreated here later with the echo chamber. Mm-hmm. I'm sure we'll touch on a little bit later. So RCA had been recording in Nashville since way back when, um, using various spaces, um, probably since sometime in the 40s. Um, and they're using Trafco, and it's it's working out okay, but there is a bit of tension there because they're recording secular music, rock and roll and country, um, pop music as well. And the church is doing strictly religious music, right? <clears throat> so the guy that owned that building, his name was Dan Maddox, gave RCA the money to build this building. It was about $35,000 at the time. And he did so as like sort of a win-win. He was a Methodist and he wanted to make them happy and he liked having RCA as a client and he wanted to make them happy. So for $35,000, this studio was erected. Um, there's a, a maybe a legendary story about the plan for the building being just sketched out on a dinner napkin by some engineers with RCA. Um, <clears throat> so the building is erected, um, that includes This room, the main studio room, the control room, and sort of a break room and reception area. Later on, about 1961, uh, they would add on a hallway with a second studio and an office and reception area as well. So So what was the day of the actual building being erected? Well, so they were building it in 1957. Um, The day of the first session here was October 29th. So, you know, around that time was when the building was finished, and I don't think it took long to have that first artist in. And her name was Joe Davis, by the way, the first person to record here. Uh, the artist's name was Joe Davis. And you see a lot of the characters who would be really important in our history present at that session. We have photos of that session, mm. right? So <clears throat> Chet Atkins is here. Chet Atkins would be managing this building, um, taking over sort of from Steve Scholes. He was, he was working for RCA. Chet was obviously also an amazing guitar player, <laughs> one of the best guitar players ever. Uh, you know, was working on his own music, was playing on other people's records and producing records, sort of doing A&R. He was basically doing everything. He founded the Everly Brothers. <laughs> uh, yes, that's, that's, that's one story. Yeah, one of the stories is that Jed discovered the Everly, Everly Brothers playing on the back steps of the Ryman, Ryman, Auditorium. Ryman, Ryman Auditorium, right? And so amazing things like that. So Chet is a huge figure in the studio. Um, <clears throat> you see some of the same session players there too. Bob Moore, who played on bass player, stand-up bass player, who played on thousands and thousands of records. Buddy Harmon, a great drummer, similar similar pedigree, played on numerous, numerous records. They're all there on that first session, right? And would be there, be here for years, right? Yeah. <laughs> so Chet's a really important figure here. Um, I don't think the studio would be what it is without Chet. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really important to mention him. So even though the studio was built with Elvis in mind, he didn't get to record here until a little bit after it opened, right? So we opened in 1957, like I say, first session's October uh, of 57. Elvis is in the army. Uh, he was doing his, his service, right? So he yeah, doesn't was, actually- Now was Elvis drafted or did he sign? I think he was drafted, yeah. Um, I, I believe that's the case, yeah. And so he, he went and sort of did his duty, right, in the army and uh, was gone from the scene for a minute, right? So he had this early success with Sun, signs to RCA, and then he's just sort of gone for a little while. Um, he finally makes it here June of 1958. So we've been open for pushing a year yeah. at that point. Um, and that first night that he comes here, he's on leave actually at the time. Uh, there's great photographs of that session too of Elvis and his army get up um, here. And cuts like six records that all chart, <laughs> including Big Hunk of Love. That's one of the first records that he did here, right? Um, so that happens in 1958. Elvis continues to record here off and on through 1971. And of course, the active period of, of Studio B under RCA, um, building still owned by Dan Maddox, by the way. Uh, RCA leased it from Dan for all those years. Uh, that period is 1957 to n- n- sometime in 1977. 
During that span of time, Elvis alone does about 240-ish songs, depending on how you count. All told, the studio does 35 to 45,000 songs, wow. um, which is an insane number. Um, I mean, they were really working at a, a tremendous pace here. Um, a big part of that was, of course, the caliber of the artists, the caliber of the session musicians, mm -hmm. which Nashville is really known for. Uh, of course, they're known as the A-Team and later the Nashville Cats. Um, people who were just tremendous musicians who could learn a song instantly and then work out an arrangement and record it. Right? Well, didn't they uh, develop <laughs> an entire scaling system for how they, yeah. like, the studio musicians would play, right? That's right, the National Number System, um, which was developed <clears throat> primarily by Neil Matthews Jr., who was a member of the Jordan Airs, a, mm -hmm. a vocal group. Uh, and they were a super successful gospel vocal group on their own. Um, but Elvis loved them. I mean, he always loved gospel music. That's a huge part of his life and story. And he brought them in to record on his sessions. Um, and so, yeah, they, they, Neil and, and there, I'm sure there were some others involved there too, developed this system where rather than reading music on a staff, note by note, they would just write down numbers for the chords, right? So if we're in C, key of C, uh, C is the one, uh, F is the four, G is the five. And so on a piece of paper, you could write down one, four, five, and you can make little rhythmic notes. Um, there's little things called diamonds, which means basically a whole note, uh, all sorts of little things that, that they would put down. <clears throat> and you can find uh, photographic examples of that too. that are amazing to look at. So yes, they use that system. That also allowed you to change the key very easily. So to adjust for a singer, mm -hmm. Because you know singers have their own particular range that they can sing in, so some key might be out of their range, too low, too high, and they can very quickly just change key. The chart doesn't change; you just change the key, mm -hmm. right? So as soon as, as soon as you orient to that key, you can just do the song with the same pattern in your head, essentially. So that was another huge innovation here. Um, during that period too, you had the development of something called the Nashville Sound, which Chet was hugely involved in developing. Also, Owen Bradley across the street at the Quonset Hut was very important in developing as well. Uh, I would say they're probably, you know, they're, they're both involved in the creation of the Nashville Sound, which really was taking country music and removing some of the more traditional country elements from it, say fiddle, that kind of thing, and uh, replacing that with a more pop arrangement is what I would call it. Basically, rock and roll and pop were sort of killing country sales. <laughs> and so they sort of re you know, just sort of messed around with the elements a little bit to make something that would be more palatable uh, to a wider audience. And they were always looking for something called a crossover hit, right? Meaning it crossed over the charts. So it'd be great if something hit on the country charts. It'd be great if it hit on the pop charts as well, or maybe the R&B or maybe the rock, whatever. So an artist like Jim Reeves, um, who recorded a lot of material here, is a good example of that. He's this sort of crooner voice, very, uh, you know, very... Appeal, uh, had a lot of appeal for anyone, basically. And the arrangements very much reflect that too, these sort of lush strings and background vocals um, to support what's going on in the song. So that happened during the period as well. I mean, <clears throat> in terms of artists, right, you have to talk about the Everly Brothers, <laughs> who did All I Have to Do is Dream here and Kathy's Clown, Until I Kissed You, so much of their music. By the way, uh, a lot of people know the Everly Brothers for Bye Bye Love and Wake Up Little Susie. Those were both done at Trafco, the building I was talking about before. Um, but they get here, uh, they do those songs, and like we were saying earlier, discovered by Chet, where Orbison's career finally takes off here. Uh, Roy had been on different labels, had recorded at Sun as well. Yeah, yeah had been on, done some stuff out in Clovis, New Mexico at Norman Petty's studio, just bouncing all over the place, was on RCA for a brief period of time, but <laughs> was actually let go from RCA, picked up on Monument Records. Uh, uh, one of the key players there is a guy named Fred Foster, a great mm -hmm. producer, who I think saw um, the unique potential in someone like Roy, who had a wonderful voice, but a different voice, right? And so he didn't have a studio of his own then, so he just came right back here and used B <laughs> to record Crying and Only the Lonely and Running Scared, these classic Orbison songs that were the thing that finally put Roy over. Um, uh, in terms of country music, I mean, Dolly Parton gets her career started here in many ways. Uh, you know, she did Coat of Many Colors here. She did numerous duets with Porter Wagner here, who recorded his own music here as well. Charlie Pride recorded here. 
Um, the list goes on and on. Hank Snow, Eddie Arnold, um, uh, Wilson Pickett did one record here in the 70s. Um, and he's an interesting character because he recorded just about every important studio <laughs> around Wilson Pickett did. Um, but he was on RCA for this brief period and did a record that wasn't that successful, but I always recommend it to people. It's called Ms. Lena's Boy, and it's a fantastic like funk soul record that was done here in the early 70s. Um, and of course you have that, all of that Elvis material, which spanned rock and roll, pop, gospel. Elvis's gospel output was really incredible. Yeah, well, talk about Elvis. He had these lights installed, so let's talk about these oh, yeah. lights. I don't know how <laughs> so, well we're getting them, but... A lot of, there's a lot of good story about the lights. Um, I believe the origin is from working on Christmas material in here. Of course, they're making Christmas albums in the summer, so they're even ready to come out for Christmas time. And, you know, Elvis, I think you see this in his home and, and, and just throughout his life. He loved to be able to set the mood, to be able to set vibe. So he asked for these to be put in. It was just fluorescent lights on the ceiling prior to that. So it must have been, felt very clinical and, you know, sort of cold in here, right? And, I mean, I think all musicians are sensitive to vibe, right, at some level. And so he wanted these colors so they could set the mood. And these are adjustable by color. So you can have just blue, just red, just green, or any combination of those colors. Um, so, yeah, working on a Christmas album, they would bring in a tree. They would bring in presents. Um, Elvis was, you know, famously giving people things all the time here. Um, they would bring in, uh, you know, all sorts of things to try to set the mood, decorate the room. Um, turn the, I've even heard of them turning the AC down to make it cold in here. <laughs> so that, uh, so that they could feel the sort of cold of winter, right? Yeah, exactly. So I, the lights are a big part of that. And, of course, they went on to use them in all sorts of capacities, right? The blue feels sort of great for maybe a ballad or maybe a gospel tune. The red is sort of frenetic feeling, maybe great for a rock and roll or something up-tempo, right? Um, so, yeah, they're a big, a big part of it is just that, um, that you could set the mood in here. You know, it's interesting hearing people uh, from back then, a lot of the session musicians talk about the studio. And they talk about it as just always having a good feeling. Um, and they talk about it as being an exceptionally good sounding room. Um, and, you know, these folks played in all the studios around and uh, not taking anything away from any of those other places. I mean, they all have wonderful history, but people seem to point out that this room just sounded really good. And I think that's still true today. It's, it's incredibly balanced. It has a lot of presence to it. Um, it sort of imparts its own sound to whatever music is done here. Mm. Um, you asked me about the most successful song of all time. Well, <clears throat> it, it likely was Elvis, um, and his biggest selling single internationally was a song called It's Now or Never, which was based on a, a, an operatic, an Italian operatic, uh, O Sole Mio, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably part of why it sold so well. It was like a familiar melody. Um, <clears throat> but that was his biggest selling single worldwide of all time. And that came from here. And so I would suspect that's the, the most successful song that came out of Studio B. Now, there were lots of others, right? I mean, some of the ones we've already mentioned, All I Have to Do is Dream, The Orbison Stuff, um, Code of Many Colors. Stuff. Yeah, absolutely. All of that, hugely successful. <laughs> so uh, just the, it's wild, really, the amount of material they did. And they did every genre. I think we've, we've kind of noted on that, but obviously country and rock and R&B. Um, some jazz as well. Al Hurt did some recording here, the trumpet player. Um, some more sort of traditional pop stuff. Uh, just anything you can think of, you know. Have any like big artists in the last decade mm. record here at all? Yeah, we've had quite a bit. So a lot of people have come back that recorded here back in the day. Um, Connie Smith has come back and done a record. Uh, Marty Stewart, who I don't Matt, he, I believe he might have recorded here back in the day when he was supporting bluegrass artists, right? But he has come and done records here mm -hmm. in recent years. Bobby Bear, who did some really landmark recordings here, like Detroit City, came back and did a record a few years ago. Um, and we had a, an album of Christmas duets of Elvis songs. So Elvis, uh, they went back to the tapes and had uh, sort of modern country female vocalists come in and sing in a duet. With Elvis. With right? Elvis. And, and we've had some other things, too. We had a, this great artist, um, a guy named Billy Harlan, who recorded here in 1958 and 59 as a 
kid, basically. He was mm-hmm. maybe maybe in his late teens, early 20s, I would say. And he was a rockabilly guy, songwriter and bass player, played with Jim Reeves on the road. He came back here a few years ago with us, uh, myself and, and John Gentile, one of the other engineers, engineered a record for him. We recut some of the material he did here back in the day, which Chet produced, um, and some other material he did. And some new stuff as well. So we had that, and then not too long ago we had J.D. McPherson come in, uh, who's a who's a modern rock and kind of in that rockabilly thing as well. Artist, uh, he's on New West Records, uh, come in and do a full length album called Undivided Heart and Soul, uh, which is a really incredible uh, sounding record um, with a lot of, I mean, just a, I don't know, it has a lot of great texture, and they. You know, it was interesting. To, I was here for some of those sessions at night with them. Of course, we do this after our after normal hours, yeah. tour schedule. Um, and just to see modern musicians like that be inspired by the space, these instruments, you know, the story, the story uh, again, the vibe, right, was, was really, really uh, a powerful experience. So tell us about the, the Steinway. Yeah. And then also let's talk about... Some of your nicknames, because you guys have some oh, yeah. incredible <laughs> nicknames here at RCA Studio. We do, B. we do. So the Steinway behind us over here, that is a 1942 Steinway built in New York. Um, it began its life at NBC um, up there. Um, I actually have a letter from Steinway. I'd be happy to show you that too. Um, they keep amazing records, and if you have the serial number, which is on the piano, <laughs> you can you can get you can get information back from them. So it was, it was completed in 1942, was there for quite a while, uh, went into the Steinway repair shop in 1955, and then came here. And it's been here since we opened in 1957, hasn't left. It's been worked on a few times, but always in the room. It hasn't really left this building. So anything we do in here, you know, thankfully it's on wheels now, but we sort of have to move it around because <laughs> uh, it doesn't leave the room. Um, so that was played by everyone. Uh, Elvis would warm up at it uh, again, singing gospel songs with the Jordan Airs surrounding him. He didn't do like uh, traditional vocal warm up stuff. He would just sing the songs he knew, uh, sometimes for hours before they were ready to record something. That was how he got into the mood and got into good voice and all that. Um, Floyd Kramer did an uh, instrumental hit, 1960, Last Date, on that piano. Um, which is, is amazing to think about, I think, today, you know, how often does an instrumental record <laughs> make it? <laughs> make it really doesn't anymore, does it? So uh, that's incredible. And he played, Floyd was a part of that A-team of musicians and played that piano constantly. Um, it's been played by basically everyone that's come through here. And anytime you hear a grand piano sound on a record from Studio B, it's that piano. Um, we have other pianos. We have a sort of honky-tonk piano that has little metal tacks on the hammers, give it a different sound, sort of sounds like a saloon piano. Think about Western movies and that kind of thing. We have other keyboards. We have a Celeste, which is bells. We have organs, um, Wurlitzer, Rhodes, all that stuff. Um, but the grand piano is that piano. I've been told, too, by our uh, piano tuners and some experts in Steinway that at that time, that was wartime, 1942. So the materials they chose were a little different than what they would have normally chose. So that even adds to how special it is. And you guys got it appraised. And oh. the, guy, the guy, from what I heard, the guy couldn't put a price That's on correct. that piano. Yeah, we don't we don't put a price on it, actually. Um, part of that's the fact that it's a, a very old, wonderful, intact Steinway, and part of it's the history, obviously. Um, it's really kind of incalculable mm-hmm. to, put a, to put a value on it. So it is uh, definitely one of the precious jewels in the collection, oh, yeah. you would say. So what are some of RCA Studio B's nicknames? Yeah, some of the nicknames. So uh, one is Home of a Thousand Hits, um, which hits is sort of loosely defined, but that just references how many records came out of here that were hit records, right? A lot. <laughs> so if you think about 35, 45,000, right, so many of those were hit, were hit records, right? Uh, quite a few of them we don't know anymore, right? I mean, there's a lot of music that was being done. Uh, that's one, Home of a Thousand Hits. Uh, The house that Chet built, again, referencing how important Chet Atkins was to the history here. Uh, Some some people have called it Little Victor. Uh, When it first opened, that was in reference to the studios in New York. So that was the big Victor up there, and we were Little Victor down here. It's interesting to think about stories uh, from some of the engineers and people uh, of the time period 
they really struggled here with getting the latest technology during the active period. They, they kind of had the hand-me-downs come down here, right? From New York. From New York and in the other RCA uh, facilities. So they were doing the best with what they had. Uh, one of the most important engineers, there were many important engineers that came through, but one that we talk about a lot was Bill Porter. Um, he did so much, um, him and his, uh, his assistant, a guy named Tommy Strong, did so much to figure out how best to use this room. Um, you know, back then, we would record live for the most part in the room. So our console from about 1958 or so to 71 had 12 inputs, meaning you could have 12 microphones going. You know, we put more than that on a drum set these days yeah. by itself. So that meant for everything you were doing, including the lead vocal, you had 12 mics to work with, right? So they had to figure out how to use the room effectively so that all the parts could be present, could be heard on the record. Um, and they did that by sort of finding spots that were best for things in the room. Uh, particularly there's a vocal sweet spot where vocals were done, but we know where the drums were put generally in the bass and the acoustic guitar, the electric guitars, the singers. Um, and I think it's important for people to know that it was relatively quiet in here when they were recording. You know, the drummers, this is a, from a quote from Buddy Harmon, that famous session drummer, weren't trusted to play with sticks until they could prove they could play quiet enough with sticks. They would make them play with brushes, um, which is you know inherently sort of lighter, right? Um, so they, they everyone had to play very dynamically. Um, the electric guitars were up on stands, and the players would sit down, so they were close to their amps, so they could hear what was coming out, and they didn't have to turn up very loud. Um, so they didn't use headphones here until the latter part of the period. How many people at one time? Yeah. Were the recording session? Well, if we sort of count it up, you get the drummer, the bassist, an acoustic guitar, probably at least two, I would say, electric guitars, just standard. You get the lead vocal. You got four people in a vocal group, or up to about 10. And then you've got auxiliary stuff as well. So you've got maybe vibraphone or marimba, maybe an organ, uh, horn section, string section. So you can get upwards of about, I would say, a dozen to 25 people or so at a time in here, depending on the song, you know, depending on what genre you're doing and what it called for. So the room would be pretty packed. Um, and it would be really easy for any one of those players to overtake everyone else. And so they were all conscious they were listening to each other in the room, again, not using headphones. So they just, they mixed themselves in a big way <laughs> in here. And also what the engineer was doing in the control room was going down live. Um, in many respects, they they were only working with maybe three tracks on tape. You know, these days with recording with computers, we can have infinite tracks as much as much as your computer can handle, really. Um, so back then, three tracks, and then we you know moving on to four. We got up to uh, sixteen tracks here is the most they had to work with uh, during the period. And again, the headphones didn't come in um, according to some of the session players. I've read until electric bass started to be a big thing because it was so loud <laughs> and it would just carry across the room. So that sort of necessitated headphones coming in. Uh, the room changed a lot over the years too. It went from how it looks now is sort of the 50s, 60s look, which you're seeing right now, uh, which is more of the open room idea. In the 70s, they put carpet on the floor, carpet on the walls, and they built these sort of huts, one for drums and one for bass to isolate things a little bit more. Um, and, you know, there was a decision made sometime in the